All right, now we're going to look at the transformations of functions. And so your homework that you left off on had you graphing some quadratic and cubic function. And we, we haven't really talked about what those mean. So quadratic functions are usually functions, um, the best way to put it is to say that they're raised to the power of 2 somewhere in there, or the highest degree is a power of 2. So if you see something else in here, like raised to the power of 3 or 4 or 5, anything bigger than 2, it's not going to be a quadratic function usually. Um, there might be some strange cases, but none that you're going to see in this class. So the first thing we're going to start off today is graphing the most basic quadratic function that you can, and that's just y equals x squared. So here's some numbers. I want you to plot these points. We're going from negative 3 to positive 3. So y equals x squared. So I've got written right here y, and I just put a reminder here that we're squaring the x, whatever this x value is. So let's go through and write out a y. When x is negative 3, you get 9 for y. Remember, negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. So let's plot that point. When x is negative 2, you get positive 4. When x is negative 1, you get positive 1. When x is 0, you get 0. 1 squared is 1. 2 squared is 4. And then 3 squared down here is going to give you 9. So it's symmetrical about the y-axis. You can see 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 9. And connecting the dots, we're going to get something that looks like this. Now, what I like to do when I introduce this in my class, I couldn't do it with you, is to have a piece of graph paper that's laminated. And then what I'll do is I'll go get some, and it, this is like a large piece of graph paper, like um, whatever's larger than your normal um, eight by eight and a half by 11 or whatever piece of paper you have. I, I get the next size up, 11 by 16, whatever it is, go to Staples and have a large graph print it and laminate it. Some big workspace for students to use. And then I buy some small um, beads like you'd make like with a necklace. And we use these little beads right here to graph these points. And so you get X squared and the students physically move this on the paper. They're not drawing it. They'll do that later, but I want to give them something that they can manipulate there at the table, and then they can see what we call transformations occur later on. Now, the other thing you had for homework last night, um, actually the equation you had for homework last night, it wasn't x squared, it was x squared plus 1. So let's look at what that would look like. So it's a good opportunity to check your homework now. Basically, you're going to take this input value right here of x, you're going to square it like we did right here, and then we're going to add 1 to it. So I'm going to write these values out in red. And basically, we've already squared all these x's, so we don't have to do that work again. But we're going to add 1 to each one of them. So we got 10, 5, 2, 1, 2, 5, 10. And this is where I like using those beads in class. I can say, let's forget about that line right there for a second. So if these were beads, and I'm making this shift right here of a plus one right here, each bead you say, okay, where is, um, we'll start with this one, the negative three coordinate, it gets shifted up one. The negative two coordinate gets shifted up one. So does the negative one and the zero. And so shifting these up, I've now just graphed x squared plus one, at least the points that we have plotted there. And now I can take and draw in lines here for the other numbers that fall in between my uh, whole numbers or my integers. So there we have it. That's um, it shifted up one. And essentially, that's what we mean by when we transform a function or transformations of functions, we're moving it around. Sometimes we take the function and we shift it up. Sometimes we shift it to the right or the left or we might shift it downward or do several things to it. We might flip it upside down. We might um, reflect it. We might um, stretch it out like, I don't know if this pen will make me do it, but I'll just draw it out freehand. We might do a vertical compression like this, or we might do a vertical stretch and make it super skinny. There's lots of things that we can do to this original x squared, and it all depends on um, the different spots in the equation where we can manipulate it.
So if I were to change this plus 1 to a plus 10, what do you think would happen to the function? Well, 9 would become, you're going to add 10 to the x squared part, that would become 19. This would become 14. Then we'd have 11, 10, and then 11 again, and then 14 and 19 again. It would shift all of these beads up from their original position, back when they were down here. It would shift them all up 10. So what if I made it a minus 3? In that case, this would go down 3 to 6. This would go down 3 to 1, negative 2, negative 3. You know what? Let's look at that. Let's reset everything here. There it is, reset. And instead of saying x squared plus 1, I'm going to change this to x squared minus 3. And so all of this is going to be shifted down 3. Oh, I forgot when I paused the video to race down here. One, and then six. So if we're looking at this, this nine, this negative three comma nine coordinate gets shifted down three. One, two, three to right there. So does this one. One, two, three. So does this one. That one brought his buddy with him, but that's okay. It worked out. And there you go. It's been shifted down three. So in general, when we're looking at this, that number on the outside moves it up and down. If it's plus something, it's going to move the whole thing up. If it's minus something, it's going to move it down. That's assuming that we got the y by itself. The number over there is going to shift it up and down. What it makes it go left and right? What makes it flip and what makes it stretch vertically and compress is the next things, next few things we got to figure out. So let's look at another function. So now I've replaced everything in here underneath the red with x plus 1 squared. So keep in mind, this is not the same thing as saying x squared plus 1. Because if we follow the order of operations, we got to add the 1 before we square it. So x squared plus 1, I would just add 1 to all the blue numbers there, and the parabola over here, whoops, that's a horrible parabola, the parabola over here would shift up 1 if I was drawing that equation right there. But this is x plus 1 and then square it. So let's go through and do that with each number. So with this one, I'm going to say negative 3, add 1 to it. See, this is going to be negative 3 plus 1 and then square it. And what's that going to give me? Well, it's going to give me negative 2 squared, which is 4. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. And negative 1 squared is 1. Negative 1 plus 1 is 0. And 0 squared is 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 squared is 1. 1 and 1 make 2. Square it, you get 4. 2 and 1 make 3, square it, you get 9. 3 and 1 make 4, square it, you get 16. So notice these numbers don't follow the same patterns we had before, but we can still see what's going on if we use that bead method and start moving the beads over. So negative 3 when we add 1 to it, square it, we got 4. So this negative 3 comma 9 part is now going to be negative 3, 4. So this bead drops down to right there. In fact, I'm going to leave that bead up there. And instead of moving it just yet, I'm going to draw red beads on here so we can kind of see a little bit better what's going on. So let's put it right there, negative 3, 4. Then we're going to have negative 2, 1. And then we are going to have, what, what do we got here? Negative 1, 0. And then we're going to have 1, 4. Or we got 0, 1. We've got to put the 0 mark in there. There's 0, 1. 1, 4. And then we've got 2, 9. And then we have 3, 16, which is going to be way off the graph up here at the top. You could go ahead and put in another marker and say, what about negative 4? If I put in negative 4 just to see it happen, 
negative 4 plus 1 is negative 3. And negative 3 squared gives you 9. So over at negative 4, we're at positive 9. So if we look at the red dots and compare it to the blue ones, what transformation happened here? And if you set it, shift it to the left one, you are correct. And the reason why I drew two graphs here is because if we move this B down, it seems like everything's just being shifted down. But really, the whole graph shifts to the left one unit. So with the plus one shifting it to the left um, one, and that's the plus one inside the parentheses here, what would shift the original blue function here to the right three? What do you think that equation would look like? And so a question like that is the ones you want to be asking. Because if you can tell me what shifts it right or left so many units, what shifts it up so many units, then you know your transformations as far as vertical and horizontal shifts go. And to really get this, what I want you to do is play around in your head and say, how could I make this function shift left or right or flip, flip over or stretch vertically or horizontally? And you can ask these yourselves, um, you can ask yourself this question, but I want you to try asking it and answering it before you go to somewhere like Desmos and try it out. But once you think you've got the answer, go to Desmos and check it because that's how we learn. We've got to make a prediction, uh, give it some good thought, and then check it. So go to Desmos once you get an idea of why, what would make it shift to the right three. And I want you to just graph the parent function y equals x squared. So we type in over on the left y equals x and then there's a couple ways you can do a square. I think the easiest is to use the caret key. That's basically the same thing as hitting shift and then six. It's that little um, notch that looks like the roof of a house. And that puts you up there and you can type in two. If you don't know where that caret key is, there should be like a little keyboard down the bottom left and then you can select the square button there. So that's y equals x squared. Now we just did, if you put it in parentheses, y equals x plus 1 squared. So if I do plus 1 and then square it right here, let's see what that looks like. Whoops, something's not right. Let's see what it wants me to do here. I don't understand. Oh, I put an equal sign there, didn't I? I want a plus sign. There we go. And you can type in multiple functions. So let's type back in y equals x squared. And so the blue function here is the original, and then the red is our, sh our shift to the left one. Be careful with these, the way they graph them out. Notice this is each notch is jumping by two, so it's shifted one left right here. If you click on the graph, it will show you that the vertex of that thing is at negative one, zero. So if you want to in all these, you can change the color just by holding down the left um, click on the mouse, and you can change the color if you want to. Um, you can also change it to dashed lines, like if you're doing inequalities like we did in the lesson, a couple lessons ago, you can do that also. But we want to know what would make this thing the green function. Instead of going to the left one, let's take it back to just x. I want to shift it to the right three. So here's a case where you can say, you can guess and check. You can say, what if you just add three to the outside? All that shifted it up three. Remember we talked about how vertical shifts happen on the outside of those parentheses there. Let's take that away. Um, what if I added 3 on the inside? All oh, that shifted the function to the left 3. So that did no good. Let's try to subtract 3. There it is. So that shifted it to the right 3. So in general what I tell my students to remember is, you know, it's kind of counterintuitive. You feel like shifting to the right 3 should be a plus. It's really going to be the opposite sign you're thinking of. So a minus 3 will shift it to the right 3, a plus 3 will shift it to the left 3. But that's inside the parentheses. Now outside the parentheses, it goes the way you think it should. So a plus 3 will shift it up, and a minus 3 will shift it down 3. We can also do a couple different transformations to it if we want to. We can say, let's shift it to the left 2, so plus 2, and then shift it up 3, so plus 3 on the outside. And so we're moving this parabola anywhere we want it to on the graph there using those transformations. So other things you can do, you can add a slider in here. So we can call that A and say, yeah, I want a slider. And now we can see how we can shift it to the right 
with positive numbers and then to the left with negative numbers there. So you can see how that shifts back and forth. And let's go ahead and get rid of that slider. Another thing you can do is if, if you don't want, you know, you want to keep this equation here for later, but you don't want it showing up, if you just click on it, it disappears for now. So it's like it's hidden for temporary purposes. Up at the top, let's move this up to the top where you can see it here. You can hit save if you've logged in like I have. You can click save here and it will allow you to save this graph to whatever you want to. So I can just call this um, parent function. of x squared. Um, so you can really do it anything you want there and then you can always go back later on. You can see I've saved a bunch of different graphs and it gives you the date you saved them too. So that's what's nice about having the account. Not to mention your homework tonight. You've got to have your name attached to it and send it to me. So you need an account to save it there. But it, especially if you're going to be teaching this stuff one day, once you start to build up more and more work um, some of these equations we start with, they get pretty complicated and you don't want to rework it every year. So the next thing we're going to look at is flipping the quadratic here. And you could play around with some of the variables, but I want to show you actually how you can add a chart to something like this. Instead of using y equals, let's change this to functional notation like we saw in the last video. So you can just type in f of x equals x squared and it knows that you're using functional notation now for that. And we can add a chart like we did a moment ago and you can look at different variables as you go along with that as well. Now when you add a chart I think it's helpful to relabel this x1 as x and then this we can now say is f of x. Let's actually put in some numbers for there. If you got 2 for x you get 4 for y because it's squaring it. And so we can go through now and actually make our chart that we had earlier. Negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. See, it's already picked up on the pattern there. And as I hit enter, it just adds it in there. So you can see those points. And notice it's plotting those points for me too. So with that being done, we could then look at, like we did on, on the other screen a moment ago, what does plus 3 look like? And it automatically updates the chart there. So if you want to see a chart as you work through this, that's how you can do that. Um, but to flip it, you try different things here. Um, let's just do a negative in front. Now a negative in front is going to, you know, when you input negative 3 square, it's going to give you a positive 9. But then you got to multiply it by this negative 1 right here. Let me draw that out so it's a little bit more clear of what's going on. So when you write out something like, negative 3 squared. If you punch that in your calculator, it gives you a negative 9. And you might say, I thought when you square a negative number, you get a positive number. Well, the way the calculator looks at it is like this. It's saying, follow order of operations. So parentheses, exponents, multiplication or division left to right, and then addition and subtraction left to right. So when it sees negative 3 squared, it looks at it like a negative 1 times 3 squared. So it does, well, there's no parentheses, oh, there's an exponent. So it squares this, and this becomes negative 1 times 9, which is negative 9. Now, if you want your calculator to know that you're squaring the negative with it, then you need to type it in like this. And when you do that, it will give you a positive 9. So for our, our problem right here, let's go back to it. This is saying square those values and then multiply by a negative 1. So you could even write the function if it helps you think about it this way. You could say negative 1 times x squared. That's really what we're doing here. But we typically don't write it out like that. We just say negative x squared. So with that being the case, it's going to make all of our y values. Oh, there's my family. Um, it's going to make all of our y values negative. And so that's why everything gets flipped upside down there. Now, one other thing, let's make that positive again. Um, let's actually go back, turn that function off. And let's turn back on and we can turn off those dots. Let's go back and turn back this one on. Now, this is the one we shifted to the left one and up three. Can we flip it? Well, if we throw a negative in front, we sure can. It'll flip it. And so the only thing else we got to look at transformation-wise to this function is 
how do we make it um, super skinny or super wide? And so if I take a number and put in front of it, like let's make, put a five there. The five actually stretches it, what we call a vertical stretch five uh, by five, a factor of five. Notice what's going on. You take the negative three, square it, you get nine because you do order of operations. We do exponents before multiplying. And then when I get a positive 9, I multiply it by 5, and I get 45. So that bead shot straight up in the air from 9 all the way up to 45. Same thing with the other values here. Now, what if I made the number even larger, like 100? Look at how skinny it gets. And you say, okay, well, what makes it wider if that makes it taller? Let's try making it negative, like negative 5. Uh, see, the negative just flips it like we talked about before. Let's hide this keyboard here. But it's still stretched vertically. So it's like I'm taking it, you know, it's like I'm grabbing it right here at the bottom and grabbing it at the top and I'm stretching it um, like a t-shirt that you would stretch um, vertically though, not horizontally. And so instead of making it a large number, let's make it a number between um, 0 and 1. So if I make it something like 1 half or 0.5, now notice it went from looking like this to this. It got a little bit wider, didn't it? What if I made it 0.1? Now it's starting to compress. It's actually called a vertical compression. So when it's a number between 0 and 1, it's going to spread out more, open up more. But what's that's what you kind of see, but what's really happening is it's being compressed. And we'll talk about why that is in a second. If it's a number between 0 and negative 1, like negative 0.2, well, the negative is going to flip it, and then it's still going to be compressed vertically. So that negative still just does the job of flipping it, and then the compression or the stretch goes um, based on what number is in front of the x. Now. When I do something like 0 0.005, let's put that in. It's, it's almost, look at it, it almost looks like a horizontal line. Let's zoom out here and look at it. It's still a parabola, but look at how far it has to come out before you start to see that. And so a lot of people look at it as a horizontal stretch, but that's incorrect. It's actually vertical compression and our eyes kind of deceive us here. So let's look at um, another way that we can see this. So here's a graph that I've got saved. Um, remember I said that Desmos is really nice to save complicated graphs. Look at the left side, all the coding you had to put in this to make this work. So a lot of stuff going on right here, and some of it's even hidden from you, the viewer. Um, I saved this graph because I teach a lot about parabolas in my pre-calc class, and this is a good way to show that when we put a number in front of x squared, um, it's either going to be vertically stretching it or vertically compressing it. There's no horizontal action going on there. So what I've got set up is the parent function x squared. All right. And then I put a variable in front of it. We call it a. And I'm going to make this thing a slider. So I've got a slider there. And so if a is equal to 0, then it just becomes 0. There's no function at all because it's 0 times x squared. If a equals 1, there's one. This is the basic parabola that we've been graphing. Now, I put these orange vertical lines here and these dots so you can see what happens with that bead. Will it move left or right or up, and or up or down? So I'm going to change this right now to a step. Let's go between 1 and um, 10, and let's make it count by 1s here. So with that being the case, that's your normal x squared. When I make it 2x squared, notice what happens to those beads. Um, well, let's, let's put it back in integers. It's kind of hard to tell there, isn't it? So let's just go between 1 and 10. As I take it from 1 to 2, look at what's happening to the beads. Those are our points. Our beads are just being shifted upwards. Or you can say that the whole parabola is being stretched vertically. And as that number gets smaller, they're coming back down, the points are. So the points are moving up or down, not sideways. But the parabola itself is opening up as that number in front gets smaller. So to our eyes, it looks like it's opening up. 
So technically it's a vertical stretch though. If we um, throw in some rational numbers here um, between zero and one, actually I'll go between zero and two. So let's look at this. If I make it two, number still larger than one, so it's gonna be a vertical stretch. As I go between one and zero though, this thing really starts to open up and we call that a vertical compression from our original parent function. It's being smooshed down there until it gets flat when it hits zero. Um, and once again, if we make this negative, let's change this to a negative two. Once it gets less than zero, it flips downward like that. All right. Maybe I'll, I'll find a way to maybe share this file in your resources so you can play around with the, um, the slider here. You can also hit play and it will do it for you. So you don't have, you can watch the graph while it goes through the boundaries that you set up for it. All right, with that being said, that's our transformations. If we go back and look at this one, this is our original, um, the green graph right here, or oh, we're zoomed way out, that's what it looks, let's go back. If you, if you ever say, wow, I zoomed out too much, I can't get back to my home spot right there. If you go back to this little home button right here, it's the default zoom, it zooms back into the original so you can see what's going on. Let's make this vertical again, uh, not vertical, but opening upward. And on this one, we can, once again, like, like we just did, we can flip it by putting a negative in front of it. This thing keeps messing with me. Let's go back to the home spot. I'm gonna bring it back down to say just plus one. And we can make it um, open up more by putting a fraction in front of it that's less than one, but bigger than zero. So we can go like, 0.34 and now it's more open. So this is a quadratic function. You know, you can look at it and tell it's a quadratic if you don't have this graph in front of you just by seeing the highest that x is raised to is to the second power. If it were a 3, it would be a cubic function. Nope, not 3 on the outside. We want 3 up top. Let's go up here and change this to a 3. So if it were a three, it would look cubic, and that's the typical cubic look. It has that squiggle to it. So we don't, we're not gonna talk about cubic functions in this class. You can take a pre-calc class or an algebra two class if you wanna see that. But for quadratics, um, that's your transformation there. Um, shift left or right is inside the parentheses, shift up or down or on the outside. The vertical stretch or compression is the number in front of that um, parentheses there, and a negative is going to flip it. So to sum that up, because I know you may want to be taking notes on this stuff and maybe you didn't quite, you know, just a little more organized manner here. If you have y is equal to some number times x plus h squared plus k, what we're going to say is we're taking the original parent function. We call it a parent function because this is like your original and a, h, and k here are all the different transformations you could do to it. So we take this quadratic parent function here, and a, h, and k's transformations affect it like this. So the k part is a vertical shift. So k is positive, the whole thing moves up positive. k is negative, the whole thing moves down. h is a horizontal shift. If h is positive, it moves opposite direction, to the left. If h is negative, you're gonna move it opposite direction to the right. A is your vertical stretch or compression. It is a stretch if A is bigger than one or if A is less than negative one. Remember, negative, if it's less than negative one, it's like negative three, negative five, whatever. The negative part just flips it, it's still stretched. And then it's a compression if A is between negative one and one. And we should probably add here that A is not equal to zero. If A is zero, then the whole thing um, just becomes a horizontal line. So if a is not zero and it's between negative one and one, it means it's a fraction. But the reason why I can't just say if a is a fraction is because things like this, 16 over eight is a fraction, but it's equal to two. So in that case, it's gonna be a vertical stretch. So what I'm saying, it's a fraction that's less than one and it's bigger than negative one and it's not equal to zero. So that kind of sums it all up. You can play in Desmos with that. Make sure you get comfortable with those things. The nice thing is if you understand this 
and you understand how to graph x squared, you can pretty much graph any parabola out there, you know, with, with a few exceptions. Um, but it's a great start if you kind of got all that down. It also translates really well into the next topic, and that is transformations of linear functions. So let's look at some of that. Now we've done some graphing already with the format, a linear function of y equals mx plus b. But these m's and b's can actually be thought of as transformations to a parent function. And the parent function we're going to look at is just y equals x. So today we've already talked about y equals x squared. We're going to take a step back and not look at a parabola, but we're going to look at a line y equals x. So if you go back over to Desmos and we graph that, that's what y equals x looks like. And so now think about what you would do to x squared to shift it up to. If you had y equals x squared, how would you shift it up to? Well, you'd say y equals x squared and on the outside plus 2. Let's do the same thing here plus 2. And notice it shifted it up to. Let's look at the original again, y equals x. Right there it is in blue. And then the red is transformed. It's shifted up to. In fact, if I want to take this blue line and move it down 4, I could change that y equals x to a minus 4, and you'd see it move down there. If we want to play around with this by adding a slider, I'd say, okay, let's add a right here. And you say add a slider. Yes, please. And notice when I move the slider back and forth here, if I just hit play, there's a couple of things. Our eyes can play tricks with us. It could look like I'm just sliding this thing at a, at a diagonal. It could look like I'm shifting it left or right. But what I'm really doing, once again, is I'm moving it up and down. If you look at it as just freezing in the y-intercept here, um, in fact, we can do that by letting this function be called f of x again. And then we can plot a point here. So if we plot the point um, x, comma, f of 0, that should do it. Let's do 0, comma, f of 0. That's what we need. And we'll label this the y-intercept. So what this is doing, and the way I did this so you'll know in the future is, I said let x equals 0 and put it into the f function. So it's going back and saying, okay, what's the f function? It's going to be 0 plus whatever a is. And so now as I play this, notice the y-intercept right here. It goes off the page for a second. But this is just one point on the graph moving up and down. We could graph another point with this. This is kind of what we did with the vertical stretch. Let's graph another point. Let's do um, the point 2, comma, f of 2. And you can see that it just moves up and down there. So those points move up and down as a goes up and down. And so that's your vertical shift there. Now, how can we make it move left and right? So if this were x squared, let's go back and look at that. I'll switch screens here. If it were x squared and we want to shift it to the left 3, we'd say, okay, we've got y equals x squared. We want to shift this to the left 3, so it should be y equals x plus 3 squared. We're going to do the same thing here, um, except for it's going to look like this, y equals x plus 3 like this. Now the interesting thing is this doesn't do much different than just saying this because of the because it's linear. So let's let's try that out. So this time I'm going to add one more line and call it y equals x plus three. And notice what it did here. Um, it's going to actually just shift the whole thing up three. There's not really a left or right transformation here. It's the same as the vertical one. In fact, if we added another three. What it's going to do is put our y-intercept up here at 6. So the left or right transformations doesn't really work out as, as pretty as it does with other functions of higher degrees. But know that the points are still moving like they'd be going to the left, but they're really shifting upwards there. So we don't have to really worry too much about a left or right shift there. Um, the other one is, how can we flip this thing? Well, flipping x squared, you put a negative in front of it. 
what happens when we put a negative in front of our blue one right here. So that's your parent function, y equals x, put a negative in front. And it looks like it just goes downhill, but what's really happening here is it's flipping. So imagine this being a piece of paper. If you were to pick it up, hold it up, and then rotate it towards you and set it back down, that's what's going on here. It is flipping it just like it does the parabola. So a negative in front flips it. Just like with x squared, let's go back and look at that on this screen right here. If I wanted to take x squared and stretch it vertically, a few minutes ago we talked about that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a number bigger than 1 in front of x here. So I might say y equals 5x squared. That would take the parabola from looking like this and stretching it vertically and making it look like that. If I'm going to do this with y equals x, I can still, you know, y equals x looks like this. If I make it y equals 5x, it's going to make it steeper like this. But really what I'm doing is I'm taking each one of these points and I'm moving them up or I'm moving them down like this. So it's still a vertical stretch. Um, I always look at it as like slope because we have y equals mx plus b. And really when you change your slope, it is a vertical stretch or a horizontal compression. So once again, if that value right there is between 0 and 1 or 0 and negative 1, it's going to make it um, less of a slope, more shallow, or compress it vertically. This B is like your y-intercept. If you go back and look at our graphs right here, when it's at negative 1.67, that's actually your B value in y equals mx plus B. It's shifting it down to that value of negative 1.67. So just like your um, transformations with quadratic functions, you could translate those into linear. I think it becomes more helpful when you look at cubic functions and um, you know, rational functions and things like that. All these transformations will go into other types of parent functions if you ever take like a pre-calc class. Um, but for this class, we're just going to focus on these because there's not too many middle or elementary um, school students that are doing pre-calc. Uh, in fact, I don't know of any of that are. So we'll keep it kind of basic here for you. Now, for the homework tonight, you've got to manipulate some of these functions. So I want you to think of them um, just, just linear functions. Um, in fact, let's take a look at the homework. When you click on the link for your homework, it's going to bring you to something like this, and you'll sign in. If you're signed in, you can put your name in right here. If you're not familiar with Desmos, you can go to the website teacher.desmos.com and there's a ton of different types of activities and games that you can assign to your students just like I'm assigning to you right now. So um, this particular one is called Marble Slide. So you're going to log in and see this and this kind of gets you set up for the activity. And so if you click this button right here, launch, it lets go of these marbles, and the marbles go through the stars. Pretty cool, huh? And the next slide, these are 24 slides here. That's the first one, a practice one. Um, you can't see it on my screen, but right above where it says marble slide, there's an arrow. You're going to click on that. That takes you to the next slide. This one says change one number in the row below to fix the marble slide. So you could look at this in a transformation type of view. You could look at this as, hey, this is in y equals mx plus b. The y-intercept is 1. Um, I need to lower it. So if I change this to negative 5, it's going to be too low. Notice if I launch the marbles, they're going to miss the stars. So I'm going to change this to negative 3. And it doesn't look high enough. Negative 2. Oh, that looks like that will work. Boom, hit them all. Now, let's see if we can find some more complicated ones. Let's see if you have too much fun. Yeah, we can skip that. You can read that later if you want. I'm going to skip along um, to some harder ones. All right, this one looks good. So a couple things that you need to know about Desmos is we can put restrictions in on your domain. Now, your domain is your possible x values, and they've done that here. It says x must be greater than 0. Notice that if I hit launch, marbles fall, and then they fall off over here. I could change this if I wanted to. Let's say x had to be greater than um, 1. That moves it to right there. That's not quite where I want it. Let's try moving it to 6. 
So watch what happens now. Oh, still don't quite get all the stars. So let's try moving it to, this is at uh, four, five, six. Let's try making it eight. Now let's see if we get there. Well, that come, came close, um, but I still got one star there. So now I'm going to change this up. I'm going to add a line to it. So if I click right here, see, I can add a line. And sometimes it's just helpful if I just copy and paste what's above right here. It gives me the same line, but now I can manipulate this. Let's make this um, negative one half. And let's change this to, let's go with zero here. And so see how it kind of start to catch there? And so your job is to play around some equations. Let me see if I can find one here that works. So let's actually make this a positive and then change my y-intercept to say zero. Nope, not high enough. Let's go with three right there. Let's see what that does. I think it's still going to miss this middle one. It does. So let's try this restriction, moving it back to nine and then launching it almost let's make it a little bit further let's go 10 whoops not 20 10 there we go now it's successful now sometimes you might want to change your restrictions around a little bit let's suppose you wanted um, x to be greater than 10 um, let's do it like this less than 10 but greater than 3 you can make it like that so you got you just make it like this. And so this will make it so that x is between 3 and 10 only. Um, that doesn't really help us out here, though, does it? Um, sometimes I like to put in vertical lines. There are things in here where you've got to type in answers. So you type in your answer, hit share with the class. Um, you can make predictions of what's going to go on. I want you to go through and do all of these. All right. I find them kind of challenging. And um, they're fun, but when you get through it all, hopefully you understand functions better, at least linear functions, y equals mx plus b. Um, you'll understand your transformations better, and that's the whole point. Um, and it's, it's just something different besides just doing a worksheet and turning it in. They make these for quadratics also, but they're a little bit more complicated. They're probably a little bit better for my pre-calculus class just because we don't have time to devote you know, a whole month to quadratics and knowing everything there is about them. So try this out for homework. If you have any questions, let me know. We can go through some solutions if, if you want to see some solutions later on. Okay. Thanks for watching this. Um, hopefully you have a better understanding now. If you have any questions, be sure to ask, and I hope you're having a good night.